Zach Wilde, and Russell Black of the Lord Choir. Please give a warm welcome to your host, Ryan J. Downey. How's it going? Great. Uh, welcome to the MI Conversation Series. Welcome back in some cases. We haven't, uh, has anyone, anybody here been to one of these before? Oh, hi, those two have. Um, yeah, we haven't done one since we were talking about it a few minutes ago. I think 2019 might have been the last one. Um, definitely before the lockdown, so. Yeah, thanks for coming in. This will be a fun way to uh, get our feet wet once again with a old and dear friend of mine. Uh, he is the guitar player in Bad Wolves. He is a co-founding guitar player in God Forbid. He has also played in the wedding band with Robert Trujillo and Kirk Hammett of a band called Metallica, who I like a little bit. And uh, very recently, he's also been filling in with the fellas in Ice Nine Kills. So, ladies and gentlemen, from New Jersey by way of Long Beach, Doc Coyle. I get my own mic. Yeah, and I, I believe there's a guitar being raffled at some point this evening. Yeah, that actually looks really nice. I think that's what's sitting in between us. I might, I might not raffle. I might keep that for myself. Yeah, you might put your own name in the, in the raffle. Just look sharp, you know. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Thanks for joining us, your friends over here. Yeah. No talking crap from the crowd, all right? You <laughs> yeah, so it is the conversation series. We like to keep it conversational. If you've been to or watched one of these before, this will be Doc and I hanging out and having a conversation about his life and career. And uh, there's a myriad of ways that that applies to what goes on here at MI. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to some questions from all y'all. So I want to start off by saying there aren't many people like you in the rock industry, particularly the heavy music, uh, extreme metal, hard rock, whatever you want to call it, uh, of your generation and of this particular group of bands in that you are something of a journeyman guitar player. You're not a hired gun necessarily, not a session guy necessarily. Uh, you have co-founded successful bands. Um, you've been in sort of band boss, band leader positions at different times. You've been kind of along for the ride and doing your thing to support. And uh, yeah, it is a really unique thing. I feel like it was something that was more prevalent maybe in the 70s or 80s, like before our time. Uh, did you ever envision that this would be your career path, that you would end up being this sort of jack of all trades and playing in so many different bands simultaneously? I, th I think the one thing that's consistent about my career is that I never had a plan. <laughs> you know, I never, when I was coming up, started playing guitar like 12, 13 years old, playing along to Metallica and Megadeth and Guns N' Roses and stuff like that. And, you know, watching MTV and it just seemed like far away, this idea that people were playing music as a living. Like, that didn't seem like a, a realistic thing. So it was just me and my brother playing in our basement, and then we met the guys, and God forbid, and, you know, we're, we weren't even good, and we're, we're playing crappy shows, and it was just all very low to the ground. And, but I realized there was nothing else I wanted to do besides that. And so it just kind of followed uh, the, your instinct. But it was only like, oh, let's record a demo. Let's record an album. Let's play a show in Connecticut. It was always these very short term, small goals. And then next thing you know, you kind of fast forward a few years later, you have a record deal, you're on, tour, on a tour bus, you're in Europe, you're playing in front of thousands of people. And it kind you're of on OzFest with a dozen bands? Yeah, but it was, I met bands later who were ambitious, who were like organized and they, they had the expectation of big success. And that was mind-blowing to me you know so it's always been like that and it wasn't until I was probably in my mid-20s I was like got a little confidence in myself and started to see it as a bigger picture thing mm. so going even further back for a moment when do you remember first falling in love with music uh, you know what did you hear around the house did you have family members who introduced you to different things and at what point 
past that, did you realize, oh, this isn't just something that I love, this is something I want to participate in. I want to be part of this somehow. So it's really important to understand both my parents were musicians. Uh, my mother's a singer, my father was a piano player and a piano teacher. They met in the same band, you know, in a jazz band. So I grew up, you know, in rehearsal rooms, at shows, hearing music, you know, in, in, a, in an eclectic array of different kinds of music. Um, but interestingly, like I was never like Mr. Jazz guy or Mr. Classical guy, even though that stuff was around me every day. Uh, you know, the stuff I probably first fell in love with was probably like a lot of little kids, you know, like Michael Jackson and Prince and like early hip hop stuff, listen to like Young MC and Fresh Prince and, you know, stuff like that. You know, things that kind of appeal to young kids when you're, you know, five, six, seven years old. But it's, like I said, it wasn't until like, I was like 12, 13 years old. I don't know something about uh, adolescence when you start getting a little bit of uh, the hormones or something. <laughs> Weird things start happening and uh, that, that, that guitar starts sounding really good. And it was really, honestly, like one moment, like a light bulb moment. And it was that scene in Wayne's World with uh, Bohemian's Rhapsody, you know, and, and there's something about me being a, a big film lover and that kind of the coalescing of both those worlds of film and music and then metal and rock and big guitars. And then all of a sudden you're like, then I started discovering MTV and just seeing Slash and all that stuff and hearing that sound, I was like, I don't know, it just drew me to it, it was like calling me. That's really killer to, to hear that that scene in Wayne's World, knowing that that was an inception point for you and for so many other people, given that it, I mean, it's a big moment for that movie, but given that that wasn't necessarily what anyone thought that movie was designed to do, right? And I, I'm sure you probably know this, but a little behind the scenes on that movie is that Mike Myers apparently had to really fight the suits to have that song in that scene. It was it, Everyone was fine with that scene, but they wanted a more contemporary hard rock song of the moment. And he was like, no, it's gotta be Bohemian Rhapsody because that's what me and my actual friends drove around listening to and doing this with. And Which is ironic because now Queen, I think is the number one streamed rock band in the world number one streamed hard rock band uh consistently uh every week in billboard their greatest hits is the top hard rock album you, you would know it's uh yeah <laughs> it's uh they uh they're doing well and it's interesting yeah because in that moment in time specifically when wayne's world was being made it was like oh that's classic rock that's you know. well in many ways that's like the tiktok of its day right like uh metallica being on Stranger Things introduced a whole new group of young people to Master of Puppets, and that's like our version of that. Um, yeah, and it, but it's a power to, it's, it's you know, maybe the best song ever written, <laughs> you know? It's certainly a contender. And yeah. 20, 20 years after it came out, it, it was just as relevant as the day it came out. So, yeah, it's a little light bulb moment, and it's it'll, it'll always feel that way. It's always goosebumps. It's always... And also that that thing, right? What makes someone headbang with their friends in a car? Like, what is that? That's universal. Yeah. Three out of four front men for the big four have had neck surgery. Yeah, it might be me next. <laughs> <laughs> so there's kind of this trope almost, especially with, with guitar players and especially heavy metal guitar players, of, uh, you know, fighting mom and dad to get an instrument and be a musician and all of that. Given that your parents were musicians, I would imagine that was at least a little bit different. What was that conversation like when you were like, I want a guitar and, and you know, well, you, my, you and your brother both? Well, my father taught my brother piano. So my brother had a little background. I tried a little bit, but it didn't really stick. And then we both played in jazz band in school. So I played saxophone, not well. Uh, <laughs> my brother played trumpet. And so there was a lot of support there. And then I think I did some choir stuff a little a little later. And, um, but yeah, we pretty much discovered the guitar all on our own. And then my father kind of saw me uh, finding an interest. I found some acoustic guitar. I don't know where it came from. It was barely playable. The strings were like two inches off the neck. I was messing around with that and he saw that. And when I graduated from eighth grade, he had got me this Ibanez like Les Paul. And at the time, he didn't actually buy it. It was 
the woman he was dating at the time let let us borrow it. And so we got that guitar. And I want to. Did say, you ever give it back? Eventually, yes. <laughs> but you know, a great great loner, great starter guitar. And uh, I want to say maybe that next Christmas he got us like an amp. You know, so we had the, we had the guitar, we had the amp, and then. I'm trying to think after that. I think after, I, I don't think we started getting guitars till we started buying our own. Like my dad was not like, here I'm just gonna give you a bunch of stuff. I mean he helped us out a little bit, but we had to like go get summer jobs and you know buy. You know, I, my first guitar I bought was a uh, Guild, like it was the kind of like Dimebag's guitar, like an X kind of shape. Um, really cool guitar. I got it for 200 bucks. And then I remember I came back and I traded it in for a Dave Mustaine V. Like the low end model, and that was two hundred fifty dollars. But that was a big upgrade. I was like, I got the, I got the Dave Mustaine V. <laughs> of his his many guitar deals over the years. Yeah, well, it's Jackson. <laughs> to me, it's like yeah. Dave Mustaine. That's is always the, the definitive. Yes. Yeah. It's always going to be that. I agree. No offense to all of his endorsements since, but yeah, when I think about Megadeth, I think about Jackson. So was God forbid the first band? There was not. There was no band before that. So we were playing guitar in our little like one bedroom apartment in New Brunswick. So keep in mind, so I'm biracial, all right? I grew up in the hood, all right? Around majority, this is New Jersey, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Majority, you know, black and Latin uh, people, not a lot of white people where I lived in the, the public schools. So we were like kind of around hip hop, music, hip hop culture, street culture, but was like kind of siphoning all this metal and rock from MTV and whatever source we could get it from. So we felt kind of like, like, you know, uh, just odd, you know, it kind of didn't really fit in. Uh, but our friend uh, that we used to draw comic books with, because before we were into guitar, we were in, we were graphic artists. We love comic books. We we're drawing comic books all day. And like, and then guitar kind of took over our interests. And uh, our friend was like, Oh my, my cousins, man, they, they jam, you know, down the street. So we went like maybe a mile away into a basement. It was Corey and Byron from God Forbid and this guy Robbie. And Byron was playing bass at the time. Oh, I'm sorry, he was playing guitar. But because me and my brother played guitar, he started playing bass. And this guy Robbie started singing. So it was, this is 1996. I'm a sophomore in high school. My brother's a junior. And we're just jamming, started writing terrible songs. You know, so we, our first name was Manifest Destiny. Then we changed the name of the band to Insalubrious, which was inspired by a carcass album called uh, Necroticism Discanting the Insalubrious, which means unclean. <laughs> and uh, Something you're very happy you haven't had to explain every day ever since. <laughs> no, we did. We, no, we would like try and get on WSOU, uh, Seton Hall's radio station, and like hand people a demo tape. They're like, Insalubridu. You know, they didn't. Yeah. It didn't really go over that that well. <laughs> it's the wrong kind of conversation piece. Yeah, well, every I think a lot of bands, you know, when you're learning how to name a band, you know, you want to be interesting and you, you think you're, you know, th you think you're being unique, but it, you know, it was a little too unique. But anyway, so that hap that kind of existed for a couple of years, doing different demos and going back and forth. And by '98, Byron had went away to recording school. Our old singer, like we got in a fight with him, he left, and then. Byron started singing for the band, and then John, our bass player, joined in 98, and that's when we were, God forbid, we kind of, we had sucked for a few years, but everything we did got a little better. You know, every demo got a little better, and then we, by that point, we kind of discovered the hardcore scene and got a lot of influence from what was going on around there, and also, really, we were just getting into extreme metal at the time. Morbid Angel, Suffocation, Cryptopsy, Nile, you know, combined with, like, all the kind of American thrash influences, you know, the Machine Heads and Sepultura, bands like that, and then combined with this hardcore thing. And then we also discovered what was going on in Sweden around this time, bands like Meshuga, At The Gates, um, Arch Enemy, Soil Work, all that stuff was really inspirational. And we kind of just fed everything into a little vat of, you know, just everything. And so we combined that. And when, when we really kind of committed and our skill got to a certain level, combined with what was going on in the scene, people paid attention. And we uh, we covered at the gates, like right away. Like on our first show was playing in basements. And that like blew people's minds because, you know, no one in the scene really had the skill level to kind of pull that stuff off. So it kind of grabbed attention a lot of, a lot of ways. Like, 
and by the way, God forbid if you don't know this, so we were like a bunch of black dudes in a metal band. So it was like these black dudes playing metal, covering uh, at the four games. black dudes and one white guy. One guy, yeah. It was, but it was like they're how the roots used to be. He's black on the inside. He's just light skin. <laughs> all right, John knows that. All right, he listens to Wu Tang every day and Nas, and he's got a kufi, you know. <laughs> So, did you have any concept in that moment? Because what you're describing, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about with the hardcore scene that was, I think, instrumental probably in shaping you in terms of like the DIY ethic and playing basement shows and so on. But also at the time, heavier hardcore, the sort of embryonic metalcore of the 90s wasn't shreddy. It wasn't really known for its musical proficiency. It was more just its like blunt rhythmic force. And so as you said, to be in a basement, to have hardcore kids there and to be able to shred Slaughter of the Soul is gonna turn some heads. And arguably, you know, what you were doing in that moment, unbeknownst to you at the time, it was creating what would soon be called the new wave of American heavy metal. I mean, together with, you know, I would say it was God Forbid, As It Lay Dying, Shadows Fall, All the Remains, Unearth, you know, there was a handful of bands bleeding through who were kind of pioneering that sound that was very influenced by a new wave of Swedish death metal, but also have this hardcore element. And oftentimes the bands didn't sound like hardcore at all, but they played with hardcore bands and played hardcore shows or signed to you know hardcore labels. Was there any sense as that movement or that scene or that subgenre was coming together that you were part of something that you had this kind of commonality with these other bands scattered well, like around said, the country? When we were, first got going, there was no commonality. No one sounded like us. Like we, and what we kind of realized was that a lot of kids in the hardcore scene were just like frustrated metalheads. Right. They just had nowhere to go. I remember we came out, people were like, you guys are playing guitar solos. You got, I mean, listen, it's a long time ago, the mid nineties, like bands stopped playing guitar solos. Yeah. You know, uh, they stopped having long hair. Also, that was like a yeah, it was like. But you'd have like new metal bands, right? Like I remember we did some shows with Mushroom Head, and the the guitar player like backstage, like like sound check, he'd just be like shredding like Ingve, and they just wouldn't do it in their songs. Like it's not cool. Or like same thing with the guys from Slipknot. Both those guys could shred, and wouldn't do it in their songs till their third or fourth album, because it was like it's not cool to to play guitar solos. But us, you gotta understand, we were only two or three years removed from learning how to play guitar and our favorite bands were Metallica and Testament and Megadeth. And so it just made sense. Like, why wouldn't we play guitar solos? Like, that's metal. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, but yeah, we came out and we didn't fit in with anyone. Like, we'd play with death metal bands and we kind of kind of fit in, but didn't. We would play with hardcore bands and we kind of fit in, but we didn't. And I remember the first time we ever played with Shadows Fall was at this place, The Saint in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And it was like, it was like, oh my God, th 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 there's more? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or even, dude, the first time we played with Lamb of God, they weren't called Lamb of God, they were called Burn the Priest. And we played in a garage in 1998 uh, in Pennsylvania. One person paid to go to this show. So it was just literally the bands watching each other. And we like exchanged demos and like, oh, you take, here's your CD, here's our CD. It's like finding, you know, the water in the desert. Like when you're like, whoa, there's other bands. And so I think what we had going on was A, like it was a real blessing to be a part of the hardcore scene because yeah, you learn DIY ethic, you learn all that stuff, but I think you learn community more than anything, you know, because it wasn't, you know, the bands we came up with in Jersey, it's like, oh, there's Dillinger over here, there's the band Thursday, like an emo band over here, there's, you know, deathcore bands, there's, you know, it really didn't have to do what you sounded like. It yeah. was about, yeah. we're in a community, and that is kind of the most important thing. And the fact that we had to really earn people's acceptance because we sounded so divergent from what was going on, um, you know, so, and all that other stuff is really important, but like all my best friends I met from the hardcore scene in New Jersey. Still, to my, my, my best friends. Like it, it was the first place where I f didn't feel uh, alienated. I felt like, oh, these, this is my tribe. I found my people. Yeah, and, and I think it's important what you pointed out about the, the musical diversity 
and the commonality that was just in the relationships in that scene of that era, I think it was really specific to that time. The idea that you could go to a show and have Dillinger and Thursday and God forbid all play that show. You could go to a show and, and it's like the Juliana theory is opening for neurosis. You know, like, and that was just like a thing and no one thought it was weird. You know, it was just, it was weird, but people weren't necessarily focused on it. I just weird. thought it was cool. It was just a show. Yeah, I just thought it was always cool. Like that's, that's how it was, you know. So you mentioned at the top of the conversation this idea of, you know, the focus was, you know, first it's on like getting a guitar and learning a guitar, then it's finding other people to do a band with, then it's playing shows and each step. Uh, where did signing to a record label enter the picture, uh, even as an idea that that could be possible, let alone once people so, were interested? So I mentioned before about being bad. Like we were not good when we started, but we, st we started getting better. And then we put out this, the first God forbid demo and which became like an EP that came out on CD and we, you know, we were doing stuff locally and I remember we did like a weekend of shows and they didn't go, it didn't go that great. You know, maybe we draw 50 people, you know, 40 people were like, we're, we hit a wall. We need to make like a full length album. So the guy who put out the EP was like decided to spend some money at, uh, tracks East, which was like the main studio, like, uh, with a guy named Steve Evans, who became a big producer, but you know Dillinger recorded with him, Hate Breed, Suicide Silence, Every Time I Die. Well, that's way later. Way later, yeah. But I'm saying at back the time then, he was already kind of a yeah, but it was hardcore like, celebrity. E even bands like Snapcase, you know, Snapcase, Dead Guy, Dead guy yeah. uh, Lifetime. He was the guy. And if you back then, this was like recording on two inch tape. You know, we did the whole record in ten days, including mixing. And but you really needed a good producer to kind of, to have a good product, you know, cause back then it, it was like, most records sounded like shit, you know, it just didn't sound good. So having a good sounding record was really important. And we basically, we finished that up. And while we're, it's getting mixed, we're like, I, I think we're good. <laughs> you know, it was like, there was like, oh, we're actually like a real band. And literally Steve Evans, the producer and the guy mastering it, sent it, sent it to, Century Media Records for us, and was that an Alan Duche mastering? Yeah, Alan, Alan, and uh, but 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 they both sent it, and literally I just got a call from the A and R guy at Century Media, Tom Bagerwitz, and he's like, "I want to sign your band." I Sight unseen. I think Tom might be the person who coined the phrase "New Wave of American Heavy Metal," and he was your A and R, and he also signed Shadows Fall. Um, he tried to sign a band called Papa Roach. And he couldn't get his bosses to uh, the, the band. All the band wanted to sign was a van. They wanted Century Media to buy them a touring van, and he said no. The label said no. Too too expensive. But actually, I th I'm not sure if this is true, but I'm pretty sure Mark Hunter from Chimera said they put it on a T-shirt first. So maybe there's some uh, hmm. dispute about that. Yeah, and I'm not saying Tom claims that. I don't know yeah. that he even claimed. That's just been sort of my understanding. Yeah. But he, he had signed Shadows Fall, you know, maybe a year before that. He was trying to sign Kill Switch Engage, but they ended up signing with Roadrunner. So he wanted to, and, and at the time, they considered us like the big three of, you know, that scene up the, at sure. the time. Yeah. You know, and, um, but anyway, but that never happens. That a band, especially back then, they, they just hear your record and like, we want to sign you. Usually they want to they see you live. They want to meet you. They want to kind of get a sense of how you do business, if you want to go on tour. It was just, and it kind of spoke, I think, to the power of that record, because it, and no one really got to hear it, because eventually, uh, Century Media wanted to buy that record. It was called Reject the Sickness, and they wouldn't, it, the deal didn't work out, so we immediately had to, as soon as we were done with that, go write a whole new album for Century Media. So a lot of people didn't get to hear it. So by the time Determination came out in 2001, a lot, a few of those bands had already kind of gotten out there. Shadows Fall mm. had gotten out, Lamb of God had gotten out. So we almost seemed behind the ball, even though we were a pioneer. Yeah, yeah. That's anyway, interesting. and I mean, and that's not an uncommon story in a lot of different subgenres and and things of that nature. Um, I remember, and I've said this to you in recent years. Doc and I have known each other for a long time, uh, but I remember the first press material that I got for God forbid as a journalist. The first line of the bio said, they may look like living color, 
but they sound like at the gates. <laughs> and I remember back then thinking that that was like uh, sort of uh, mind-numbingly uh, patronizing. You know, it was like, look, there's a picture of some black dudes, but it, uh, it sounds like it's from Sweden. Um, but I remember bringing that up to you more in sort of recent years, and you weren't bothered by it. You thought it was like, I don't know. Well, not your, your guy's idea. written a lot of bios, right? Huh? Yeah. You've written a lot of bios. I have. Right? So let's say you take a new band and you go, what's your story? Yes. And, and that is important. Here's, here's the truth. Most bands don't have a, an interesting story. So <laughs> it's just like they're pulling, you know, pulling hairs out trying to just tell something. Sure. So, so yes, is it low-hanging fruit? Yes, I agree. And you know who did that? It's Amy Ciaretto who did that, actually, did that bio. And I love her. We both love her. We love, we love she's Amy. She's great. She's, so, she's a friend, a colleague, great writer, great publicist. But I say this, I go... And I've made fun of her for this, too. So, But you know who's also, you know, uh, famous for looking like Living Color? Living Color, you know? So, you know, so, you, know you gotta be famous for something. But, <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll say it's better to be known for something than nothing. So if you're the black band, I'm like, hey... Yeah. Guilty as charged. And I'm not saying that that shouldn't be an element of the story, because certainly it yeah. is. I mean, you, you introduced it into your own story yourself. It's just, yeah. to me, it was more about the way it was phrased. It just yeah, I, listen, who, who knows? Corny. Maybe if there was But hey, I remember it 20 years later. There we go. I, I have no idea, because I can't say what, how it should have read, or I don't know. Maybe, I guess, in, in this today's context, that would be regarded as cringe-worthy or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Or... Uh, too on the nose, or or in, in many ways, I think it might also speak to uh, how novel it yeah, was, and, and, at the, the time. and the limited number of, of reference points at that time. Yeah, not and, just in being black dudes in a band, but also in sounding like at the gates. There weren't very many bands that were kind of following in that tradition yeah. of that well, strain. Which well, well, is one of the things I hear from the artists that followed us and were inspired by us is that they felt like God forbid made. It okay for them to like what they liked and to pursue their career um, despite their race. And now I think it's not a conversation. You just see a band, you know, um, mixed mixed bands with with all different kinds of races or different genders and sexual preference and all that stuff. And it's it's not a story now because more people feel welcome. Uh, the pie is bigger. And it's at the end of the day, I think if if. It's always been this way to some degree. If you're good, it doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, someone had to be, not that we were first, but it's certainly in this genre, we stood out more than most. Yeah, for sure. So as you're kind of rising through the ranks and that whole scene is happening, I mean, I remember this sea change of, you know, OzFest was certainly early to mid-2000s the predominant place for heavy music um, from a touring perspective and especially for sort of smaller developing mid-level bands having an opportunity to go out with, you know, Judas Priest and Slayer and all these, you know, big bands at the main stage. I remember vividly going to Ozfest one summer and I want to say it was 2002. The side stage I was at, at the show in Dallas, Texas. The side stage was predominantly new metal. A lot of bands who were si who were signed to major labels but weren't necessarily known and had you know a lot of backing, a lot of financial support, and were being you know placed on the second stage. There were just you know it just seemed like innumerable bands who kind of looked and sounded the same. And then there was also Kill Switch and Shadows Fall, and it was also I think the first summer that Howard was running Kill Switch. And I just remember it being this like lightning moment of watching that side stage all day, and it just being so bland and boring. And you really felt like and it's funny to say this in 2023 when new metal's cool again and people are all about it, the revival, but you really felt like it was over that summer and you saw these metalcore bands that were new and fresh and different. And I remember shortly after that Ozfest, there was a Kerrang! magazine article on Killswitch and the headline was, Killswitch Engage Kills New Metal Dead. And uh, the next summer, that second stage, you know, and then the summer after that, you know, by 2004, the side stage was bleeding through, throw down, Lamb of God, God forbid. Uh, I think every time I die, Earth to my die, darkest hour, darkest hour, on Earth. It I was mean, all betray you. Yeah, betray you. I think was the next year. No, yeah. they were they were on the same year. In 04, and then yeah, yeah and then they Devil were Driver. Six. Yeah, yeah, but no. So the, well, the Devil Driver was was kind. Of, it's kind of fun in this whole narrative because. 
that was a, a new metal guy. They're a bridge band. They're, they're a bridge band. Yeah. Two years later was back on Ozfest as a metalcore guy. You know, no, no disrespect. I'm just saying it, it says a lot of like kind of what the, and it's 2023 and he's doing his new metal band again. They're on tour. Um, yeah. The way yeah. stuff cycles around, right? In terms of what's So you have cool. the years off. So the year you're talking about with Shadows Fall and Kill Switch was 2003. Three. And then we, it was four when all when it was every band yeah. was a metal We band. did the fo- following year. And yeah, it was a, uh, a sea change. And yeah. What people had an appetite for, you know, the thing that I said, we were like so early, there was no scene for what we were doing. That scene became the main story. And that's, I think, with a lot of bands, um, you know, especially if you're like doing an old school style where it's like young people fresh out of high school or college starting something, you know, those are the people that are always going to drive art and what actually is impactful, you know, like. A 55-year-old is not going to put out Smells Like Teen Spirit. You know, like that's not, the youth is the ones who make the uh, make the movements in culture. And so we were a part of that. And that's a beautiful thing, being a part of something that moves music and inspires people for however long. And, you know, and we just did it long enough and we're that committed and got to be a part of something, you know, and it was, a, and that was really like a, a peak time, I think, for what we're doing from like 04, you know, like 03 to like 06 was a really good good time for what we were doing. And I think as is natural for a lot of young bands or any genre, musicians, you know, you're, you're constantly in this upward climb and it's, it's moment, it's peaks and valleys, but you're, you feel that you're ascending and uh, you're touring internationally, you're getting to play these big festivals, you're putting out records that are acclaimed and and then kind of younger bands are coming up behind you and they're starting to cite you as an influence and then you wake up one day and you realize like wait a minute we're like we're not the young band now we're the older band on the tour and or this band that used to open for us now we're opening for them and just that sort of natural cycle that happens um do you remember a time where you had a sense that that season of the band had kind of run run its course or that it was winding down or that you would maybe be figuring out what else you're going to do, what your next step's going to be? Sure. I mean, these cycles, I think when you're, you know, when you're in your early 20s, you know, like a year or two, it feels like such a long time. You know, it's like a whole year passes and like you have a whole lifetime of experiences and things change. So when you take that, like if you put a record out in 05 and you're like the toast of the town, by the time we put out the next record, it was 2009. And 2009 was like Deathcore was coming up, bands like Suicide Silence and Whitechapel. Um, and then also Gent was becoming this new thing. It was like, uh, you know, uh, Periphery and Animals as Leaders. And all of a sudden you, you were kind of like, you were the cool kid in town and now you're kind of last week's, uh, last week's news. And you know, we kind of started to see it kind of happen right there. And the thing with God forbid, we were never, we never made much money. We were always just getting by, and uh, it was a band that had to be grinding on the road and yeah, I mean, couldn't but, really but, stop. And, but I just, you know, none of us I think had a great sense for the business. Uh, we were just committed. We loved it. It was a very family-oriented operation. I don't think anyone was there because they thought they were going to make a million dollars or anything. It was just like this was our lives. And my brother quit the band in two thousand nine, and for me that was like a kind of you know an emotional wreckage for me and then I also realized that's all I had been doing for my whole life like I said I never planned anything so I also never really built much in terms of I think a fully formed psyche you know I had all my self-worth was derived from being in a band Mm. and making music so that was my form of validation and I didn't have a great um underpinning. I didn't have a great foundation. So I actually had to spend about two years figuring out who the hell I was. You know, I was damn near 30. And this happens with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. When you, you start a band, either you're a teenager, you're early 20s, you have your run, you put out your few records, and then things start going down. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm close to 30. Everyone I grew up with is having children. They're buying houses. They have jobs. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> And, uh, and I had to kind of go on a, uh, a journey to find out who I was and become 
a better person and become, you know, I had to grow up to some degree. Um, and so that was like a few years, God forbid, put out like one more record. Um, and then, you know, things just really weren't working. The band wasn't making money. I mean, I had one situation that just didn't work out for me with the, uh, the singer. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. 2013. And then I, uh, I moved out here a year later. And what was the idea of moving out here initially? You know, I mean, opposite, opposite coast, and it, you wake up one morning and you're not Doc from God Forbid for the first time. Well, I, uh, something I didn't mention that's really important part of my personal story is that same year, 2009, uh, Mark Morton from the band Lamb of God asked me to fill in for him on lead guitar for a tour with Metallica. The beginning of the Journeyman story. Yes, this year. yes. And at that time, I'd never played with anyone else except God Forbid. And it was really intimidating. The, the, their Lamb of God songs are very hard. And I'm playing lead guitar. These are, you know, in my wheelhouse, but still very challenging, very intimidating. And it's also with Metallica, the biggest band of all time and my favorite band. Um, and, and not to interrupt you, but I think, I think this is important for this MI context especially. Um, uh, in addition to everything we, we just heard and we've just talked about, the trajectory of God forbid and making a name for yourself, can you point to anything specific about in that moment when Mark knew that he was going to have to miss a significant portion of this huge tour for his band, getting to open for Metallica, what made you, of all the guitar players that he's met on the road and so on, why you? I mean, you'd have to ask him, but it's, <laughs> I think... Do you have any sense of like what the relationship you had with him or... Well, I mean, I think it had, he thought I could do the job. And on that same run, I think they had Buzz from Unearth filled in for him for a couple weeks stint on a European leg. And maybe he couldn't do all of it or, or something like that. Um, but I think what was emblematic about that moment is for me, like, all I thought about was my band. It was very a we situation. It was never me, I'm the man or anything like that. But it was a reflection that kind of other people see you differently than you see yourself. You know, that actually people out there value your skill set and think highly of you. And, you know, and that was like kind of like a very weird moment that, oh, I can maybe I can do more than just this, you know. And and when you're out there and, and I did the gig and it went well and I felt like I did a good job and you proved to yourself you can do that. And it's on the biggest stage with the best bands. It's that's it. There's no higher rung on the ladder. Um, and then you can hold your own then all of a sudden, it, you know, the way I looked at myself and the, I had more confidence in myself, I was more self-assured and, uh, you know, but then you're part of a, your own band, you go kind of go back to reality and mm -hmm. you have to deal with all that and you're only one person, you can't just make everything work out, you know? So, but that one experience kind of put that in my head and then when I got home the next year, I started playing in a cover band doing like uh just rock songs, Led Zeppelin, No Doubt, um, you know, Living Color. Uh, <laughs> you know, all just a whole wide variety of, of rock songs. And a lot of it was just to actually expand my horizons as a player, because I was just playing thrash metal for however long I've been playing guitar, and I felt I was a little one-dimensional. And the cover stuff was in New Jersey? Yeah, Jersey, yeah. So I, I did that, and Who then... Who were the other players that you were... I mean, you don't have to name all the names. Yeah, just not anyone, it, in probably general, anyone here would know. My, my buddy Scott, brilliant drummer, he played in a band called For the Love Of. That was a really inspirational band for God Forbid, but he had really gotten schooled and was doing, like, you know, real, real session stuff, real, like, working musician stuff. So it was his band with his uh, girlfriend. I think the bass player had played in Hanson for a little bit. So they were very high-end players. So the fact they even thought of me was very, uh, I really appreciated that. But it was a lot of tunes. And it just felt like going to, you know, going to school to a certain degree and teaching myself different vibes and different styles. And then when I quit, God forbid, I started teaching um, and I got hired at a uh, school of rock in New Jersey and also at Guitar Center. And then when you have to teach guitar, you actually makes you learn more because you go, oh, I got I have this bit of theory. I better learn it up so I can teach people. And I just kind of went, I spent a few years just going back to basics and learning things outside of my comfort zone. And that was a really uh, pivotal time. 
especially before moving to uh, LA because now instead of just, I'm this thrash metal guitar player who can do this one thing, I'm actually a rock metal guitar player. I can play rock music, I can play some blues. I've been you know, developing my vocals through those years. I can sing, I can harmonize, and you kind of develop a different set of skills. You know, and so when I came to LA, I felt a lot more prepared, or I felt like I could do a wide variety of things. You know, and I think that's really important instead of being a one-trick pony. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great lesson from your story. Uh, so the intention behind arriving here was the idea, you know, all you had known was God forbid, and then you have this opportunity with Lamb, and you did the cover stuff, and you know, teaching, everything you just mentioned, was the idea then to come here and start another band or to join someone else's band or or not be in a band or, you know, what was the... So I'd, I'd actually started a band called Vegas Nerve and it was more like kind of melodic, progressive rock to some degree. It's still in your Twitter bio, I believe. That's right. Well, the, I never, never stopped doing the band technically, but me and the singer actually decided to move together and then he reneged. <laughs> On, on coming out here, but I already decided to come. And uh, at the time, I was 32 years old. And for me, I felt like I was, you know, I think I was 32. I had already done a band for half my life that had failed, in my opinion. So I felt like I was over the hill. I was like, I'm, I'm like, you know, spoiled milk. There's, <laughs> you know, I'll put me out to pasture. So it's because usually when people come to L.A. to like, chase their dream it's young people you know it's people in their early 20s all right they got their guitar on their back they're gonna go tackle it you know like the uh welcome to the jungle video yeah. david elveson moving here from minnesota at 18 exactly and enrolling in the musicians institute there you go being neighbors with dave mustaine down the street and then never actually showing up here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, so i felt like i was single didn't have anything holding me down and i was like you know what if i'm gonna do this Now's the time to do it. But I did, did, it did feel like a, uh, an uphill battle. And, but I came here without much of a plan, without any money. And my, what, what were you saying was, I, was my goal to start a band? I was just looking for any opportunities, you know, to join a band. Because I think at first I was maybe looking more for the hired gun type thing. Like, let's see if I can just be that guy, you know, be the assassin. And part of it was almost like, seeing if, if I was actually good enough to be one of those people because you come here and it's really, really high level, high skill people. And if you can swim in those waters and hold your own, and uh, I don't know if you guys know about the, uh, the ultimate jam night that they do in, uh, at the, in West Hollywood at the, uh, the whiskey. They used to do it at, um, what's it called? Uh, Lucky Strike. And it was huge. And it was like all the best people. And I remember it was a big thing when I started playing those and getting the respect of, mm. you know, the, these are people who are, have real gigs, like real top level, badass people. And then when I kind of cut, and they didn't know me, they didn't care about God forbid, I was just another guy, you know? Um, so it was like, I would take anything I could get, just any kind of, oh, I'm, you guys need a studio thing? All right, I'll come and I'll record some stuff. You need me to do this one show, whatever, anything I could do. Um, but actually the first gig I ever played in LA was Rob Trujillo from Metallica, uh, has a band called Mass Mental and my, the drummer in my cover band I was working with at the time, this guy, Ken Schalk, he played a band called Candiria. Yeah. Played Shout in, out Candiria. Played in Fuel, Legendary. He was in the Misfits for a hot second. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, so he was filling in for Mass Mental and... Mass Mental has two bass players, but they have one section of the set where they do three Black Sabbath songs. And they need a guitar player, and my and name. Keep, keep in mind, Rob, someone who's played Black Sabbath songs with Ozzy. Yeah, and times. Zach Wild. <laughs> yeah, and Joe Holmes, and like <laughs> yeah, some of the yeah. best guitar players that ever live. And um, Rob had known me from doing the Metallica dates with Lamb of God, and so I got the call when it went into jam. They're like, all right, sounds good. Did the gig. It was at the Whiskey. You know, Ozzy was there. Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses was there. Stuart Copeland from The Police was there. Wow. It was like, you, you have to pick. This is my first gig in L.A. And, uh, you know, did it. Went well. Next day, Rob calls me. He goes, man, you did great, man. You have a great attitude. I like your feel. 
you know, it was like, you're going to do great in this town. And it was like, I was like, yeah, LA is a little different than other places. Cause that just doesn't happen. I feel like, you know, I was, before I moved, I was working in New York a lot and hanging out in that scene. And it just feels like there's a lot of gatekeepers. And here I felt like there's just, op- there's just things you're, you're in the proximity of the people at the top. And if you're good and you're bringing something to the table and you have a great attitude, things can happen quickly, you know? And that, so that kind of was a, and he kept calling me after that, just rehearsals and did a couple gigs and things like that. But it kind of, things like that just instill you with the confidence that, all right, this is, these are some of the baddest dudes around and they like what I do. Okay. That's, that helps just build something. And one thing kind of leads to the next. And that's, and that's just, also another thing, another tool in your toolbox, another uh, you know group of people that you've played with, another situation that you've gone into, maybe a little uncertain and come out having conquered it, and each of those accumulates. I think it's really important what you said a second ago about you know Rob recognizing your attitude, yeah, because I think you know as much as obviously um, you know and those of you who are students here and everything you know as much as we all focus on technique and ability and and talent um so much of it especially for the situations you've been able to either find yourself in or make happen for yourself being a good hang you're a good hang you're a good dude people like you they feel like they can trust you they want you around and that's like I, i mean i don't think we can overstate how important that is and what a great example of that i think you are in particular because yeah, you have the chops and you can do the work that needs to be done when it's time to go to work. But the other, you know, 22 hours out of the day being on the road with somebody in those situations, you want somebody that you like, somebody cool. And you've kind of been that person. Yeah, I mean, it's I'll be honest, man. I almost feel like the playing is almost supplementary. Like, I really feel like I'm like. They, I really feel like they, they just like hanging out with me. Like, they, like Einstein Kills brought me out. They like they didn't need me. They, 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 we just like, like three guitar players. Part of me, I'm like <laughs> they just they just, they just like hanging me, have me around. It's yeah. it's really strange. Um, but no, just on a, on a more serious note, I mean, I think if your project is significant um, and you have resources, you can probably you have a lot of high level people at your disposal. Um, but people, you know, I was talking to someone. It's like if you had like a, the player's a ten, but the personality is a five, mm-hmm. you would rather take a player who's a seven, but the personality is a ten, almost every time it's gonna win. Um, and because the truth is, there's also I think a correlation between people who are insanely talented and being a little wired, <laughs> a little weird, where maybe sure. they don't play well with others because you have to be so crazily driven to get that good at something or just be you know it's a different kind of individual you know so and at the end of the day it's like you kind of uh hinted at this when we first started talking about this idea of me being in different roles and me like i don't know how how many people here are in the sports but the sports analogy to me is perfect in that sometimes you're at the center of things and you have to be the leader and rah rah and you're making sure everyone else is doing their job and you're on top of it. And sometimes you have to be a role player where it's just, you're taking someone else's orders or you're trying to execute someone else's uh, vision. And it's really important on how to exist in different roles and don't show up and start telling people what's what. You have to have social awareness. You know, when you get in a room with other musicians, especially, that's a, it's a very intimate environment. You know, it's your, there's egos involved, you know, you gotta, you gotta make, you know, you, you know, you have to like feel what it, it people are going through. Cause sometimes you get in the room, right? And everyone actually, there's actually a little bit of nerves. Like everyone has that little insecurity. Like, I hope I'm, hope I don't blow it. Right. Or whatever, whatever. it's, there's a kind of, it's emotionally charged or let's say someone's screwing something up, but you don't know how to talk to them about how to, Hey man, you know, it's, you're kind of rushing on that part. Like, how do you do that without pissing that person off or making them feel too self-aware? Cause sometimes if you're overly critical with someone, now they're going to mess up more because you didn't 
communicate it to them right. So it's like, I feel like a lot of what I do, and especially on tour, it's just actually, and this is something I kind of learned working with Rob, uh, Rob from Metallica, is that he's like the minister of positivity mm-hmm. in the jam room. He's just getting people in good vibes, getting people, because we're all, we're all insecure as players. I think we're all like worried that we're not good enough or what or whatever. And it's just like it's all because it's all contagious. You know, if you can get some because someone comes in with a bad attitude, that's contagious. You know, this person has an attitude. Now I have an attitude because they have an attitude. But if you just remember, that's all about it's supposed to be fun. I don't care what the gig is. It's ne- it should never feel like, you know, you're you're dismantling a bomb. You know, it should. <laughs> It should like I would say it's playing music, man. It's not working music, and it is hard work. But if if you're smiling and you're vibing, that you know four hour rehearsal is gonna fly by like that because you're into it. Speaking of rehearsals, you found yourself in some situations very recently, even where you're learning two, three, possibly more different bands sets simultaneously yes while also being out on the road performing (laughs) and then also dealing with the business of like this other band that's your main band has a record coming out and this other band that used to be in i'm doing that now actually currently you were currently doing that um what uh, have you learned about and what are you still learning about how to balance all of that you know uh, when to say no when it's too much uh how much you can juggle well, you know, the physical demands. I know you. You know your wrist was a little sore yeah, there yeah, for a no, few days. Yeah, I was having all kinds of problems. I actually, went to a specialist to get it checked out because I was playing guitar every day for you know nine weeks straight. You know, just crushing myself. But no, like I think what I realized about myself. Another big reason why I think I do well with you know being hired by bands and keep getting gigs is I'm extremely well prepared. You know, I come in, it's like, I know the arrangements top to bottom. I have, you know, I have notes, I have tabulature. I know I can, if someone, you know, this song, this part goes three, I have it right here in my notes, that part's three times, you know, just as a, and I think people appreciate that. And one of the issues I have with the Ice Nine Kills thing is like, they called me and they wanted me in the rehearsal studio a week after. It's like 17 songs, crazy guitar solos and they had no learning materials and so i feel like i didn't come to that at a level i consider uh at my you know standards of how i think i should be prepared and so like i realized like my superpower is preparation and if i don't have enough time to prepare it's going to be hard to be great i don't you know some people you can just they can kind of just dial it in you know they're I don't know who those people are, but I'm I'm jealous. Like I have to really take my time and be deliberate with it. And it's also when you're just trying to cram a lot of information, man. That just turns your brain into like a bit of a soup, and you have a, a kind of a threshold, you know, about how much you can absorb in one given time. And it's also stressful, you know. It's like you got a show, we're playing in front of you know five thousand people. You better be you better be on top of it. So um, I don't know, like I've this year has probably been the busiest year of my life in terms of just pure work, you know, and you ha- I think the, the thing with this is a lot of things that are good for your career might not necessarily be great for your personal life, mm. you know, in that um, you can only be at one place at one time. Every minute you spend doing one thing is a minute you can't do something else. And I'm pretty obsessed, you know, with just like going the next thing boom boom all right we're going here i got like right now i'm preparing for two tours fit you know 30 songs and i'm organized you know i'm doing i'm doing not just learning the songs i'm doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff and it's and I'm, i have a record coming out on november 3rd i'm doing promotion it's probably too much you know uh but i'm of the mind like when things are going and you, opportunities in front of you you have to just Go and do it, and unfortunately, there's there might be some wreckage that comes along with that. You know, you're I think staying close with your friends and family. It's it's tough. It's tough to be as connected, and that's a uh, that's a downside. I think uh, 
And I think probably with any career that someone is extremely obsessed with that takes them away for, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week where they're just honed in and locked in. It's sometimes it's tough to get back to square. So I haven't figured that part out yet. Work in progress. Yes. Uh, but it is amazing, you know, even, you know, listening to your story as we all just have, to think that, you know, 32 and God forbid had, had gone away and you felt like maybe that was it. And, and, you know, and then to fast forward to sitting here in 2023 and as you said, you just had the busiest year ever. You just uh, toured with Metallica again, playing in another band. <laughs> you know, it's like... And we haven't even talked about Bad Wolves. <laughs> And we haven't even talked about your actual main band. <laughs> That's how busy you've been. Yeah. Um, and before we do that, I do, I, want, I do want to talk about Bad Wolves, and I do want to open it up to questions. Uh, but I want to ask you a little bit about the wedding band. Sure. Because you were talking about uh, you know, doing the mass mental thing, playing in the cover band in New Jersey, and how that all sort of – and preparation, like you said. Preparation, being a good hang, all of those things that make you, made you so well-suited – when this wedding band opportunity came up. So for those of you who don't know, it's Kirk and Rob from Metallica. Uh, John Theodore from Queens of the Stone Age plays drums. Yep. Uh, Whitfield Crane from Ugly Kid Joe. And Mark, the singer from Death Angel, or kind of co-vocalists. Um, Doc, of course. Who did I forget? I forget anybody? That's pretty much the core the lineup. Core but lineup. then we'll bring in like uh, Avi, who's like text for the band, who's in... Um, Goodbye Texas things, man. He'll play like keyboards with us sometimes, and we'll usually bring in local. Has he played with Metallica also? Like yeah, their, he did something some recently. Stuff yep. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Really talented. Uh, but we'll bring in horn sections for uh, the live shows because we do a lot of funk tunes. This is a band that will be playing Highway to Hell or TNT or something, and then we'll play like you know a cameo song. Yes. Like, by uh, choice, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah, or Cheech and Chong, or yeah, it's like a lot of funk, a lot of classic rock, um, some hard rock, and yeah, it's like a wedding band, a band that you would see at a wedding, but it's all these superstar players. I still haven't been to that wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's wedding. If I ever get married, I'm calling you guys. Um, so yeah, I mean, th so that came just organically, right, through having become friends with Rob and playing with him and him seeing how prepared you are, and because that's a band that. Certainly, that volume of material, that diversity of material, all these players, all these people who are busy with so many other bands, I feel like you're probably a rock for them. Am I, am I wrong to say well, that in terms of I, I, the preparation? And I like found my way into that band. So because I jammed with Rob with Mass Mental, uh, I was on tour with Bad Wolves, and I saw this thing about the wedding band. I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's a cool thing. And I get an email. It's like, hey, uh... Uh, Kurt can't make this rehearsal in LA. Can you learn these songs and just fill in for him at rehearsal? I think it was something like, I don't know, 18, 19 songs, but I had learned a lot of them for Mass Mental. So I had a good bass. And uh, and it's like, you know, Rob calls, you show up if, if you're free. So did the rehearsal, went really well. I felt good. I was just, I was just happy that he was happy. I'm sitting there wrapping up my cables. And he's like, yo, man, it's sounded really good man he's like man i think it may be cool man maybe get you on this gig and they were playing in in toronto and he's like let me make some calls you know 20 minutes pass and i'm thinking i was i was just happy the rehearsal went well and i'm thinking i might be able to do it and he's like he's like yeah you know he's like we don't really have the budget for it i'm like now i got all excited so i was like Look, what if I buy my own flight? <laughs> and he's like, uh, let me get back to you. So later that night, he called me. He's like, if you can, you can pay for your own flight, we'll, uh, we'll take care of your hotel and you know, food and stuff like that. I'm like, all right, cool. So flew, f did the gig, you know, and it was, it was great. I think we did one like sound check where we kind of ran through. I don't even know if we ran through everything. We ran through a lot, but it was just real easy. It just and went. Did you really know the other guys? At all yet at that point? Um, I, I knew Whitfield, and, and then Joey Castillo was actually playing drums. Who another also Queens of the Stone Age drummer? Yes, yeah. yes, great, great drummer. Zach Sabbath and Danzig, and another, yeah. another journeyman, a journeyman drummer. Yeah, so I mean, I, I pretty much knew everyone, and Kirk, I had you know met before because we I toured with him, but we weren't like close, you know, or anything. And and it was kind of weird because it was a four piece. He was the guitar player, so it's a little like, hey, what's up? You little on my 
little on my corner, buddy. Don't get, I'm sorry to feeling too good about yourself. So, you know, it was a very like, just, I was very happy to be a part of that. And that obviously when you're playing with people of that magnitude, I'm also a lot younger than those guys. Um, just, you know, just, it puts you in a different plane. You know, it's one of those things when people see you on the stage with those guys, you get a lot of friends. Hey, you know, I'm so jealous. I can't believe. How did you get that? Who'd you kill? You know, um, and for all I knew, it was a one time thing, but they just kept calling me back. And so eventually it was like, I'm in the band, you know, but, you know, talking to those guys, you know, a lot of it, you know, to them is just a lot to do with how I kind of prepare and being, you know, because they're so busy. Man, those guys are just, it's crazy. Like, you think the bigger you are, you get to like chill out a little bit and put your feet up. No, their schedules. It's all day. They were, and they play, they will play music all day. I remember we did a gig. Metallica was doing the 40th anniversary in San Francisco. We did a wedding band rehearsal at 11 a.m. Went for, I don't know, three or four hours. They went and did Metallica rehearsal for the whole rest of the day. And then did a 10 p.m. wedding band rehearsal after that. And we went to like one in the morning. They will play like you have to pull them out of the studio, <laughs> and then like we're taking a break, and Kirk is just he's just still playing guitar, and you go to his you go to his uh, hotel room. We could do a lot of jamming there. He's got ten guitars, all out. All he does is play. You, know, you go, to, you know, Rob. He's sitting there and he's oh he's working on this, you know, jazz piece. You know, just yeah. like it's all they do there. Like I said, that obsession thing, man. You have to be a little crazy. Yeah. To, L- to lately, do this. those two have been writing. A little mini song for each Metallica show that they write that day specifically for that city, perform it, yeah, at the show, and then well, never, it's never heard again. Well, that's the thing; they're also very spontaneous. You know, like yeah. uh, Kirk loves like, you know, every time he's, he wants to change the arrangement, he wants to add the, this little fill on the intro, he wants to, add, you know, and it's a lot of. Also, just jamming and freeballing and like just kind of going for it, and it's kind of cool when you have people of that magnitude and just letting things go. And it's dude, some of the rehearsals, it's like some of the coolest stuff I've ever been a part of. And it's like, and then you play the show, and it's like it's never as cool as like what kind of groove you kind of fell into a rehearsal where you kind of found some magic. Because I and I I love that too because it's so much. It's not about the audience. It's just about you vibing together and like really getting off on that that collaborative element of playing with other musicians you know it's it's special you know yeah uh so i believe i did have a little bit of a plan i know we talked about having a plan or not i did save bad wolves for last because Mm -hmm. i think that everything we just talked about has made you uniquely suited to handle the good, the bad, the ugly, the the highs and the lows of this Bad Wolves thing. Yeah. Because uh, had you not been on the journey that you had been on, I don't know that you would have been prepared for the, what from the outside looked like very quick success for Bad Wolves, and then a very public crash, and then this rebuilding period of of almost, you know, building the band twice, yeah. essentially. Um, And for those who don't know, of of, of course, I mean, you know, here's this band that you're in way later after starting God Forbid as a teenager. Now it's your first gold record and then your first platinum record and then another gold record. And that first big platinum record was a cover song that just happened to coincide with a a tragedy around the time. You know, I mean, just all these things that lined up that I I really feel like had you not, if you weren't you, if this was happening to somebody else, I think it would have been a whole different story. I mean, in terms of... Well, it happened to other guys in the band and they couldn't really... <laughs> right, <laughs> <do it>. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had to be... Well, I think I'm uniquely... Um, I guess... I don't know, man. I'm just a survivor. Like, I think what sets me apart from a lot of people, and it has a, has a lot to do with me quitting, God forbid, like, that's like a very defining moment in my career. And moving here is like, I'm not afraid to lose it all. And I think a lot of people, what happens, they get a little, they get a little pile of nuts and they're like, I'm, I gotta, I gotta protect, protect my pile. And I'm like, yeah, fuck the pile. Because this industry, 
what you kind of notice about this industry is any industry where you will do the work for free, you will have people who will exploit you, mm. okay? Um, and so they will hold that over your head, right? Oh, you want this show? You want this gig? You better do this. You better do that. You want, you want this record deal? All right, well, here, sign away all this stuff, right? Um, and so when you're in a position where you're like, I got to keep this thing, it's like, no, they're going to use that to manipulate you. You got to go, you know what? If I lose it, fine. And you, and you just have to, if I have to start over, I start over. It's okay. Hey, I did it before. I'll, did it, I'll do it again. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if anyone knows the whole Bad Wolf situation. I don't even know if it's worth kind of going, going down that road. But I feel like I have a temperament um, that can just kind of take a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing you, because I'm saying, if, if someone, there's nothing they could take away from you if you're, if you're willing to go, hey, it's all right. I lose this job, I'll just get another. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an amazing attitude to have. I mean, well, I, I would say the cliff notes on the Bad Wolves thing is that for any rock band, uh, changing your front person, you know, it's like, you know, changing coaches in the middle of the Super Bowl or whatever, you know, as you're cruising along. And, and we can sit here and we can name successful singer changes, whether it's Iron Maiden or Van Halen, uh, ACDC. But then with, you know, in fact, two of those three bands, you can also talk about unsuccessful singer changes. You know? Sure. It's well, I think it's more akin to like, uh, like if McDonald's changed the mascot. Instead of like Ronald McDonald, it's like, it's Donald McDougal. <laughs> and he, instead of... Deal with it. He, he wears green now. He's a different haircut. And people, what the fuck? You know. <laughs> like, yeah. that, you know, it's, it's all brand association and, and personal association. And that's, and that's understandable, you know. So. But a lot of it, I think, does speak to your character and your temperament because of that situation. And not to even single bad wolves out or any individuals out because you can also take a macro view of this, and it's happened with plenty of bands, rap groups, whatever. There was a lot of public airing of laundry and mudslinging and people Ugly. trying to kind of verbally smack you around. And you were, you weathered the storm. Like you came out just looking like the good dude that you are. And that could not have been easy because you are a human being and I'm sure there were plenty of times that you were like, wow. Oh, no, I wanted I to, I, I still want to, you know. <laughs> That's other people told me not to say stuff. Yeah, you know, trust me, I wasn't above it. I was ready to get in the mud. <laughs> but let's talk about the the rewards. The challenges are obvious, but the rewards then of this current season of Bad Wolves, of making music with DL, of getting back out there, get still having opportunities to you know get support tours to go out to headline shows, having this record that's coming out as we're taping this, I like to think these conversations are evergreen, but as we're taping this, the record is, is imminent, it's a few weeks away. What's been some of the most rewarding part of this chapter of not only Bad Wolves, but of being Doc Coyle? I mean, I don't know if the reward has even come yet. I think it's, listen, you just, you have a bunch of challenges in front of you, and the, the, the actual discipline, right? is busting your ass to make something happen and somehow also not being invested in the result. Mm. Because I've done this, I've just killed myself making an album, killed myself promoting an album, killed myself touring on an album to have it not do what I wanted to do or not have the band be as successful as I want to. And then you take that on personally and you feel like a failure and you feel defeated. Um, but if you can somehow make it about the process and not the results and go, well, I'm, and just enjoy doing the work. And if you enjoy doing the work and go, you know what, actually the one thing I can control is if people like it, is if it's successful. But unfortunately about this business is even if you don't personally need that validation, you do still do need enough customers voting with their dollars to give you the opportunity to still keep doing it or else you can't do it. So it's this weird thing of like, going, I really don't give a shit if anyone likes it. I'm doing me, but going, well, the business kind of cares if people like it because we need to sell this many tickets, we need to sell these many t-shirts so that we can have the tour bus and 
pay the the crew and everyone can kind of do, do that thing so it's a very tough balance so i'm i don't really think about it in terms of reward i think you know making the record is its own reward right um right. kind of slowly getting to share that with people as songs come out and developing it but i i almost look at it like a war like i'm just every day it's like what's the battle plan what are we doing what's all i gotta do this interview okay it's gonna be the best interview I ever gave you know um and like right now we're preparing for a tour so it's rehearsals and and that stuff is fun it's like especially when you're playing like new songs and you're you're trying to fit you know it's always like a you know like a putting a puzzle together just getting it together and like slowly playing it together and making it sound good and then you do the shows and you see how it's connecting and it's just something you build over the course of time so i, I don't know I, I i really try and just live in the moment and not you know, it's like uh, some people go, are you excited for this show? I'm like, well, on the day of the show, I'll be excited about it. I'm not living two weeks from now. I'm here doing what I have to do today. Like That's, that's hard, man. That's easier said than done. But yeah, that also that's helps. That's how I am. Because if you're not excited about two weeks from now, you're also not worried about yeah. two weeks from well, now. I have, I was, well, actually, let, let me change that a little bit. I do have preparation anxiety and fear. Like, I, I don't know you guys here, but I'm like a million times I've had the the, the nightmare where I can't find the stage or I'm on stage and the amp amplifier doesn't work or the or this worst one is like man I'm on stage but I don't know any of the songs oh, I have to figure these out I've had that one a bunch of times so there's definitely the uh the kind of anxiety about you know uh dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's like just making sure all the prep work is done and so and I feel like if you do all that then it by the time the actual the time is there you, you actually can be at ease because you've done all the work and that's that's the main thing so but that's almost that is I would be lying if I said that anxiety for me is not real so it's more like I have the anxiety about screwing up not necessarily living in the future about some great success or validation or I'll feel you know well, I can see a whole through line and a lot of connected tissue here where even with all the experiences that you've had, the highs, the lows, being able to live and work as a professional musician and, and to be creative and be a songwriter and all these great things, you are still, in a lot of ways, the same kid that's just focusing on that next thing. Like, let's get some band members. Let's get, let's write songs. Let's book a show. Let's book a show out of town. What, like you're still even with, you know, the big world of yeah that you're operating in now. It seems like that same approach is still really serving you well. Well, I was, you know, the whole God forbid experience. To be honest, was heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking doing something that's your whole life, and then it fails. And what was I? I went. I was bartending. I was doing. You know, I was doing all kinds of other things for a few years. And I moved here, and I was like, the only thing I want to do, my only goal. It's not necessarily like, oh, I want to join this band or I want to make a platinum record. I want to make a million dollars. I was just like, I just want to be able to get up every day and do things I want to do professionally, you know, and I've achieved that. Now, does that mean I'm, you know, got a Bentley or anything? No, but even that I think is, I can't say that most people can say that, that they can do that. And, that, and obviously that's not for everyone, right? If you have responsibilities and it's like well I need to do maybe I, my this isn't my favorite job in the world but I need to do this to pay bills and take care of my children as there's no shame in that at all um, but as a selfish bastard uh, <laughs> uh, no but but no but that that was a, a goal of mine to be able to go let I want to pursue my creative goals and spend time doing things I enjoy and and you know as a I think when, you know, I think Chris Rock said something about that. You know, we, when you have a career, there's not enough hours in the day. But when it's a job, you're looking at the time mm -hmm. like, all right, is it five o'clock yet? Um, and because when it's the things you're passionate about, you know, it's like I go to sleep and I'm like, all right, I, you, you, the ideas never end and the excitement never ends. And so I, I'm gotten to the place where I can do that. And once that plate's kind of spinning, all you're trying to do is keep it spinning because you don't want to, I don't want to go back to bartending, you know, unless I want to do it, you know, you know, unless, you know, maybe I buy a bar or something, but you, you know, I don't want, once you've had that, uh, achieved that idea of I can work on the things I like to work on, that is something I'd like to maintain because there is a fear of 
having to get up and go somewhere and dread doing something. Because it, it's, it's always there. there. It's always lingering like a kind of, you know, a monster kind of chasing you. And that's the thing. That is a certain motivation for me personally. Yeah, and I think some of that is even coming from working class and blue collar roots. I mean, I, you know, Alfred Hitchcock struggled with fear of poverty his whole career, even at his height. And I think, yeah, that's, you know, when we come up that way, that, that is always that. If you don't have that fear, fear. I, don't, I don't know, you must be real relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a microphone here and a microphone there, and we definitely have time for some questions. So, yeah, if you guys just want to step up, I will point at you. Tell us your name and where you're from, if you're a student here, not a student here. The one right here? And, uh, yeah, just kind of making fun. Making sure people see both. Um, and uh, yeah, and then ask your question of Mr. Doc Coyle. Yeah, hi, I'm Ashoka with Love and Lightning. I'm from San Diego. And thank you so much. Thank you for your candor. Oh, no Doc. problem. And uh, particularly, I'm curious about that time when you were at that low that you've referenced a couple times. Uh, you mentioned waking up and facing each day like a war. I'm a former Army Special Forces soldier. And the journey from that world to here involved that old identity getting burned to the ground, mm -hmm. you know, becoming that liquefied caterpillar. And uh, there was a lot of despair that went along with that. And during that time, a lot of beautiful music came out of me that was music of, of hope, of light for, for veterans in particular, but really for, for everybody. And I'm curious, what were the tools that you used when, when that identity collapsed and you didn't have that, uh, that footing anymore? Believe it or not, I got really into self-help. You know, I started uh, in probably the most pivotal book was one. Uh, it was called The Seven Daily Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, this guy, uh, I think Robert R. Covey is the name of the, uh, the author. And it spoke to me on a, on a few different levels. And there's things that just basically, I re and when you look at a lot of uh, self-help stuff, you start to realize that a lot of it is very similar. It teaches a lot of the same stuff. And a lot of that is just, one, accountability stopping blaming people for your problems mm. you know stop blaming the world oh what was you know oh, you know it's like it you know as i say uh, complaining it's a zero percent roi return on investment like nobody nobody cares like oh something bad happened who cares like figure out oh you don't have you know this tool or what do you have what can you know and so being accountable because i felt like i was someone who had self-pity you know and and i i had this idea that oh i deserve blank and I got that I got rid of that word out of my vocabulary I was like I don't don't I don't deserve anything like because if something bad happens to you do you deserve that did is this some karmic reason you end up there so why do you deserve the good things that happen right it's just like no you work hard you do your best and hopefully things work out so that was a big part of it but also uh it speaks to this um idea of the uh, emotional bank account you know this idea that you have people in your life friends and family relationships where you're if you're all only taking withdrawals right and you're not investing in relationships and you're actually giving back and it's not like you shouldn't be taking score of like who's doing things but it's it's important that like the people you have around you that you have to invest time and energy into that and you don't you know don't be an emotional vampire like so it's about that, like creating good uh, relationships, being accountable, um, and uh, and I just had to. My lack of sense of self worth was based on the fact that I hadn't earned it. Like you need proof of concepts, you need uh, to build confidence by accomplishing things, and then having the confidence go, oh, because I did that, I feel confident. Like having confidence out of nowhere kind of makes no sense. So it's kind of a, a lot of those things and, and just building a good framework. And also just going back to square one, going like, all right, I'll go work a job. And that's okay, right? Getting rid of the ego like, oh, I'm supposed to be a rock star. It's like, who, get, who cares about that? Like, there's It's like there's plenty of people who will never make a living from music or art or whatever, and they work another job, and they just do it on the weekends. They do it for fun. Or they, you know, they have a cover band and they enjoy it. It's like, who can, like, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But people put this false, like, expectations or they think I'm supposed to be this. Just, you know, do what you enjoy. So 
That's the best kind of summation of it. But it took time. And also, the, actually, the last thing was I actually had to figure out what I wanted. And I actually didn't know. Like, and that's, I think, a lot of times as you, this happens with uh, kids in, uh, who are going to college where it's like you're 17 years old. And someone's like, what do you want to be for the rest of your life? And they, they're like, uh, 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 a psychiatrist. You know, they don't, why should they know? Like, if you do know, great. But I think it's just okay to not know and really take your time to think hard about what it is you want. So those things. Thanks so much, Doc. Really You're appreciate welcome. you, man. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Appreciate it. it was awesome. Well, I guess double veterans tonight. <laughs> Navy <laughs> pilot. So are you from New Jersey? I am. Okay. This is the question I want to ask you because I'm actually from here, but I was educated in New Jersey. I went to school. At what part? Spirit. At Seekin, like South Jersey, yep. okay. by Margate. I lived in Margate. Oh, right. Um, but do you feel like being from the Northeast, that work ethic we have that's drilled into us has helped you like get over the hurdles and the obstacles in life? Well, I think specifically in relation to Los Angeles, most of the people I knew that came from my area tended to do really well here mm. because th there is that just grind. You know, and I felt like... I'm sure it's probably different now because, you know, the cost of living and, and everything. But I felt like when I first moved here, when I, when I thought about New York, right, people knew New York, they would, people would work 12 hours just to, like, yeah. barely get by, right? But here, you could work, like, a little less and be, like, you're, you could kind of chill. And it's, like, it's nice out. It was like, hey, well, let's go to the beach, you know? It's all right. You know? Like, I, I came out here and I saw people literally just chilling, just doing nothing. Just li I'm like, Damn. So, but you, so the, like the option for some people is like, oh, I can just, you know, chill. I can, you know, stay on this person's couch or find a, a rich person to kind of glom off of. <laughs> but if you go, hey, man, there's actually, there's just so much potential out there, you know? And the, my favorite thing about LA is you come here with a clean slate. If you say, I'm this, there's no one to say you're not that. If you can do it, Right, like, and, and, and like I said, that idea of less uh, gatekeepers, I found to be amazing that they kind of, there's a clear path from the top of any field, at least in entertainment and like media, I can't really speak to other fields outside of that. Uh, if you have the requisite skill set and charisma and all the things it takes to get there, there's really nothing stopping you. And I think just the grind of being in New York and Jersey, like, that every day where you're used to, it gets you further here than it does over there. Can I ask you a follow-up? Sure. You're a Jersey guy, right? Yes. So, like, my favorite Jersey singer is Frank Sinatra. Do you have one? I mean, it's Frank. I think Frank Sinatra is the best voice of all time. Tell me Thank you. you very much. You got it. When we had uh, Mr. Brendan Urie here at the MI Conversation Series, we talked a lot about the chairman of the board also. He's really? a huge, huge Sinatra guy. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of Sinatra vibes. Shout out to Mark Tremonti. Tremonti does Sinatra. Yeah, exactly. Um, did I see somebody over here? Nope. Two questions. That's it. Two <laughs> questions. Done. There's another question. Well, he, he took my question. So. But, um, and, um, sorry, my name is Phoenix, and I'm a new student here uh, with the Independent Artist Program. Nice to meet you, Phoenix. Cheers. You as well, your story was very um, inspirational to me, especially being a person of color and liking rock and having to kind of find that permission to like what you like. Um, but my question isn't about that. Um, you said that when you were coming up, you sucked. <laughs> and I wanted to yeah. know, did you think you sucked? Then? Yeah. Or is that like hindsight? Well, no, no, thing? actually, here's a better way to put it. So <laughs> having my father uh, be a musician, right? So we did our first, you know, we were in the, in the jam room, just practicing, you know. At that point, I don't think we really knew we sucked, but we, we did our first gig at a place called the Court Tavern. Uh, I don't even know if it still does gigs anymore, but uh, in New Brunswick, my father watched the show. It was like, you know, I don't know, eight or nine people, you know, friends of the family. And he, you know, the only thing he says, he goes, you were out of tune. <laughs> that's, that's all I said and so I think there was a perception it's like where you think you're good in the, the basement but then you like do a show and you go you get, you get a little mirror 
up to what you're doing and go, oh, this isn't good. Or you go to a recording studio and you hear like, oh, or like how not tight you are, or how uncohesive the material you wrote is coming across. Um, but I actually think it was the most, uh, the best thing about us was that we were self-aware of comparing ourselves to the bands we wish to emulate and we saw the gap. And so every time we would like slightly close the gap and we, one thing I experienced, you know, I don't know how scenes are t today's day and age. Back in the day, it was like local bands and local scenes. And these bands, right, they would be like a pretty bad band, but they'd have a lot of friends. So those bands would play and they'd bring like 200 of their friends out and their friends would like kiss their ass. So the bands were delusional and they thought they were good because their like mom and their like cousins would come out and, and high five them, tell them they're great. We didn't have any friends. So we would go play shows like, like we would go and play in like Rhode Island or somewhere. It's like they don't care. Like if you're not good, you'll, you'll be able to tell. So we were just very honest with ourselves and maybe almost deprecating, you know, to self deprecating to a certain degree. And then once we started getting good, and we started to see it like so it almost like sneaks up on you you're like oh like you're playing all these bands you're like we're better than all these bands you know and then eventually but it came to us very slowly and i think it just makes you a lot more honest with yourself and know and also set the bar high and it's like we want to be as good as mashuga we want to be as good as machine head we want to be as good as in flames and i don't know if we were ever good as any of those bands but we got to play on the stage and be right there and be on the same playing field and earned it step by step, piece by piece. That's, that's good to hear because I had a, a similar experience today in my live performance workshop. I was like, <laughs> 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 so yeah, that's cool. Thank well, you. and it's also something I personally struggle with where I'm, again, I've always had this thing where I don't see myself the way other people see me. I'm always thinking, I'm, I'm terrible. I need to, you know, I'm just, and it's, and that, and I think that's something artists in general struggle with um i wish i had that just that self-assured you know just like you know i think i sell it pretty well even if i you know if i'm going out for a, a rehearsal it's a new band and i'm i'm gonna project i'm not gonna because i think if you go out there and say yeah i suck like then people might actually believe you or it'll color how they perceive your performance like you have to kind of keep that down and still present confidently even if inside you're like i don't know if i can pull this off you have to kind of sell the thing it's and it's I, I don't think it's ever going to go away well, for me at least um but that's okay that's our individual struggle and to some degree that's the thing that makes you work harder because you don't think you're good enough so okay i'm going to put this extra hour in these extra two hours in because and for me i always say like i'm not good enough not to prepare i have to get my homework right or else i'm not I can't wing it and be good, you know? Thank you. You're welcome. Let's talk about this guitar. Don't clap yet. It ain't over yet. This ESP right here. Yes. It's, uh, there's a bunch of names in this bucket. Okay. Uh, the folks in here, are these your names? I think that's the only reason they're here. <laughs> We're just gonna keep drawing Where's it. Where's the free shit? I got I got thirty seven more questions before we give the guitar man. Sure. Uh, no. Uh, let's see here. I'll, how about I do a little shuffling for you? Yeah. And then you can Why? do the honors. My name's only in here five times. I think I'm gonna pick a name, Jock Boyle. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh. That was straight. Somebody almost got kicked out of the bucket. All right. I feel like Kill Tony with his name in the bucket up. right now. All right. This feels dirty. Chris Tanaka. Is Chris Tanaka here? It's Chris here. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Give it up for Chris. Oh, you gotta get up. Congratulations, So Chris. Does, he, does he just take it right now? I mean. Congratulations. Thank you. I think so. <laughs> oh, thank you. Do, do you want to give a speech? Uh, I'd like to thank the Academy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great job. You're, you're the best winner here. Thank you. Out of all the yep. winners. Of all the Chris's that have won an ESP tonight, you are my favorite. I just get one with the guitar. 
How does this work? How does this work? Stuck it's trapped in that. It's a trick. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. It's like Excalibur. <laughs> we'll have our people talk to your people. <laughs> Dude, thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Congrats. Amazing. Um, Give it for Chris. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> One thing that we did not talk about that I do want to mention, in addition to the Bad Wolves record that's coming out next month, the X Man podcast. This guy started doing a podcast before every single person you knew had a podcast. And uh, it's fantastic. And this whole idea of the X-Man, you know, you, you kicked that off at a really interesting point in your career where it was like, I'm the dude that used to be. I'm yeah. the X, God forbid, guy. And you had this kind of concept of bringing on other X-Band members and X, you know, people that were known for a thing that they're not necessarily doing anymore. And certainly since then, as you have grown and evolved, that podcast has grown and evolved, and now you're, the guests are just the guests without necessarily being married to that theme every episode. But um, like and subscribe that thing, folks, if you aren't familiar, because it's pretty great. So it actually ties a lot into the themes of a lot of what I was talking about with you, uh, you know, talking about that time when I was struggling. When I, you hit that point where you're like, should I even be doing this? Should I just go be a carpenter or, you know, become a veterinarian or wh whatever, just... You you got to be wired a little weird to want to be in the creative fields to like make a living. You know it's hard. You know very small percentage actually make any money at all, and then only a very small percentage of those make enough to make a living, and then even a smaller percentage of those can actually be make a comfortable living. Um, so we hit that point at a certain time, and I, you know maybe it's different ages for everyone where you've been gr at the grind and trying to figure it out. And I just start. What actually before I started the podcast, I started writing, blogging. I don't know if people blog anymore, yeah. but that was a thing of the uh, the two thousand ten. I remember reading some of your stuff on the VH1.com, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's right. But this is even before that, you know, and a lot of my writing was kind of being very honest and open about struggling about where I'm at in my life, and after doing a band and figuring it all out. And I thought that was fertile ground for a podcast and bringing on, you know, the idea is the X-Man is like someone was in a band for X amount of time. Now they've moved on. And how the hell did they figure it out? Like, because some, some of those people, they didn't go back to being in a band, right? You had guys like Lorenzo from Sworn Enemy, who now he's a big time actor and director and he's doing things. And that's like its own cool story. And you have some people like me who were in one band or is out in the wilderness, they found a new band that was bigger than the old band. And there's that there's there are chapters to this thing. And so on the show, if you can you listen to a you know a dozen of those, you'll start to see these patterns of like what is the map? What is the type of person who kind of can persevere through uh, the ups and downs? You know, um, and it's also like not everyone is a lifer. You know, some people they have it's like their seasons, right? They have like their their time when they're doing the band and doing the, that thing, and then they kind of like they've had enough and they move on to the next chapter. I mean, Ryan here was a singer in a metalcore band, and he went on to other things, great things, you know. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean you're just because some one thing doesn't work out doesn't mean you're a failure. It means that failure is the greatest teacher ever, you know. Um, you know if you've you know, your first band is the Beatles. You can't teach anyone how to create the Beatles. Like, you're just like, eh, well, we showed up and then we sold like a billion records. It was pretty good. You know, it's, you know, it's like, I, <laughs> I think it's true. You know, because you've had amazing uh, all-time legends on this stage with this series. But it's like, I don't think Tony Iommi can teach you how to be the guy who invented heavy metal. You know, but if you find someone who's screwed up a lot and had lots of ups and downs and found kind of a, you know, a blue collar sense of this thing, that's much more easier to replicate, I think. But still, oh, yeah. try and be the Beatles. Don't, don't, don't dash your dreams. Yeah, and as uh, our mutual friend, the great Dave Peters, once said, and I quote all the time for decades to come, Never trust anyone in the music business who didn't try to start a band first. Anyone never slept in a 
floor. <laughs> you can sleep on a floor, Bill's dirty, di- dirty floor in a in a sleeping bag. We don't if, trust. If you didn't show up to the show and the promoter told you that there's no PA and you're singing through someone's bass amp. Nice. Yeah. No, but for real, it's like that 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 uh, impetus, that drive to be involved. Uh, I I feel like most of the time, nine times out of ten, starts with creating music and wanting to write, wanting to perform, wanting to collaborate with other players, and that initial drive might lead somewhere else uh, equally or, or more fulfilling, but even well, just starting in that place. Just to pivot off that, also, you know, the writing, the podcast, for me, are very similar to the creative outputs that music provides. So it's like this thing of, it's, you know, I, yeah, I was bartending and doing other things, but I actually found other career opportunities in pursuing other creative fields, you know, adjacent to music and almost kind of in service of it as well. But that was something that kind of opened my eyes up a little bit as well. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for coming and hanging out with us on Thursday night. Thank you. And thank you to the great Doc Coyle of Bad Wolves. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ryan. You're the best. Love you, brother. Love you too, man. And thanks all of you for coming out. The MI series, the MI conversation series, it's back. Do more of these. It's been it's literally been years since we did one. So thanks for uh making it happen with us again. I do what I can. They pay me in coffee. (laughs) And liquid death, ladies and gentlemen. Liquid death. Tonight's sponsor. Have a good night. Everyone drive safe.